So for anybody who's de debating whether climate change is uh, real or not, just remind them the $5 trillion a year industry whose entire survival is based on very accurate modeling and predictions puts climate change as the number one factor threatening their industry. And we're live, Raheem. How are you, my friend? Good to see you, Ian. I'm well. Thank you for asking. How are you? Living the dream. And it's, <laughs> it's, you know, it's so cool seeing you speak at the Planet Home event. I've spoken about it on the podcast before. One of the most amazing events I've ever been to. What were your thoughts on the event? Extraordinary production value, great content, you know, so multifaceted, experiential, visual, auditory. I mean, they, the, even the food curation was great. They did a fantastic job. That dinner was next level. I, by the way, I, I looked up the Guinness Book of Records for the longest dinner table, and I figured for sure that was going to be them, but it turns out it wasn't. There was one somewhere in Saudi Arabia that was something like over a thousand meters, like over a kilometer long. Yeah, it's insane for, for the guys listening in. We, uh, we were in basically like an airline hangar, was it? Maybe at one point. And there it was, was an airline hangar. It looked like it could have held the spruce goose for sure. That thing was massive. Yeah, it was just an absolute spe uh, production. And there was so much good quality people everywhere you look. And I think that's something that really turned my head about that was everyone was so open to communicating with each other. It's like this whole crowd of people that is truly dedicated to helping climate change and supporting them. It's such this, this brotherhood that is very unique. I haven't seen it in different types of cliques and cultures. Yeah, I agree. It was very well, very well curated. Even the audience was, you know, you had to apply and they made sure that you had something to offer to the community, whether it's, you know, uh, some, you know, ideas, business, production, charity, um, you know, the whatever finance, whatever it may be. It was a very, a lot of people left and they were able to conduct business, fund opportunities, ex hire people, expand um, their customer base. It was very, very productive. Yeah, absolutely. And Brahim, I mean, everybody wants to save the world. Everyone knows for the most part, unless you, you're really living on another planet, that we, there's a serious issue going on. But And people want to make changes, but people don't really know exactly what to do. And your company is very exciting. Uh, full cycle. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Congratulations with everything you guys are doing because you're doing, in my opinion, this talking with you is going to be one of the most productive ways to really learn what's good in climate change and technology and what's happening because you're putting your dollars behind companies that are making applicable changes and doing it in a way that's going to be scalable to help the world. You know, the world revolves around money, creating smarter financial decisions and putting your money where your mouth is. Mm -hmm. And I love the quote that was front and center at Planet Home. It says, solving the climate crisis is the greatest investment opportunity of our time. What, do you, what does that mean to you? So, so first thing, um, you know, thank you for acknowledging our work. And it is a passion as well as a business. I, I grew up as a scuba diver and the oceans are the canary in the coal mine. Back in the early 2000s, I saw firsthand what ocean acidification and warming oceans were doing to the marine life and coral life and it was devastating. And of course, we all have heard about the problem uh, of plastic and how we're getting buried in all these single use plastic items everywhere in land and ocean, I started to see them. And, and I just had a wake up call one day when my favorite scuba diving spot went from being lush and green and, and vital to being barren and full of used tires and plastic bottles. Um, so I realized that, you know, making money or accumulating wealth on a planet that's deteriorating or even dying is an exercise in futility. So unless we start directing our ingenuity, our capital, our entrepreneurial activity, our governmental, our laws towards balancing our ecosystem or even, you know, maintaining Earth's life support system, who cares? 
you know, the uh, Steve Jobs said, I don't want to be the wealthiest guy in the cemetery. In, in that come up phase, like you see this, I'm also a scuba diver. I got certified at 16 and anyone that's a diver knows it's just not the same. It's not the same. And a lot of times people think, you know, you got to change it from the top down. You got to get the laws in right. You got to make change. But most people say, who am I? Who am I to make that change? When did you feel like you kind of empowered yourself to believe that you could actually make that change? Well, so since your, you know, your audience are entrepreneurs, we're all wacky that way anyway. You know, that we have a screw loose that, you know, stops us from wondering whether or not, you know, we can make a difference. We just, you know, we look at opportunities and we look at what needs to be done. And, you know, yes, you know, we don't have all the answers in the moment. Yes, we look at it as big and daunting, but it's our nature to look at challenges and and know that, hey, it, it takes more internal effort to ignore something we know we can positively affect than just to go ahead and go through the tedious, boring, challenging, painful exercise of going ahead and changing it. Um, so I think that's how we're wired. We're entrepreneurs. And for me, the most important um, thing I could do with my at that point, my wealth, network, ingenuity, entrepreneurial drive, um, ideas was to direct it towards balancing the or stabilizing Earth's climate because that is foundational. So, you know, it's like there's a quote by Carl Sagan that says, you know, what you're interested in doesn't matter if you can't breathe the air and drink the water. Right. Yeah. It's like, so uh, climate is foundational. And I thought, great. Well, first of all, you know, the climate change, most people don't understand what is the cause of climate change. So, and there's this, you know, there's this uh, effort by those who benefit from continuing to use our atmosphere as an open sewer and use our o oceans as a dumpster, you know, uh, because that's their business. Like they make a lot more money doing it that way than being responsible for the externalities of whatever their business happens to be. And they've done a decent job that's now been debunked, you know, telling, confusing people about climate change. But climate change is a math problem. You know, the earth has uh, what's called the carbon cycle. So all of, you know, all of the live matter on earth breaks down into CO2 and gases that eventually turn into CO2. And then once it, once new life gets built, it sucks down that CO2 and builds itself because we're carbon-based beings, right? So there's about this 100 gigaton cycle that reconciles every year. Earth produces 100 gigatons, sucks down 100 gigatons. And then this new species, you and I show up on the scene a couple hundred thousand years ago, you know, develop farming, develop industry, build cities, you know, make stuff, you know, talk on Zoom over the internet, do all these things. <laughs> and, you know, what we, what we use to power our civilization are fossil fuels. So, and we also cut down a bunch of trees, right? So here's this, you know, here are these living beings that used to suck down carbon, which is, you know, trees, and we cut a lot of those down. I think in the U.S. now we have 2% of the forest cover that we used to before human beings showed up on the scene, 2%. And alternatively, we've discovered old prehist you know, prehistoric fossil fuels, right? We found coal, we found oil, and we burnt it. So here we are, we took this 100 gigaton perfect cycle and killed the organisms that were sucking down the carbon or a lot of them, which are in a lot of the plant life, and dug up ancient CO2 and released it in the atmosphere. So now every year we add about 8% to that, what used to be this uh, perfect cycle and you know, do that over 250 years of industrial revolution and you end up with a lot more heat trapping gases in the atmosphere than the earth can absorb. And over time, it just heats up the planet and heats up the planet and heats up the planet. So why is that a great investment opportunity? And it's a great investment opportunity because 
the problem isn't a plastic straw problem. Like that's not the problem. The problem isn't, um, you know, the, a lot of the things that, you know, we talk about on a consumer level, it's really infrastructure, right? Like the underpinnings of modern civilization, the things we don't think about, like when we turn on the light or we turn on the microphone, it works, right? It works because somewhere out there, there's a power plant that's producing electricity 24 seven that goes through a wire and makes this conversation possible, right? Uh, when we turn on the tap, later and have a glass of water or take a shower, miraculously there's hot water, there's cold water. The point is there's flowing water. You know, when we press a button on our phone and Uber shows up and takes us somewhere, you know, that all has an impact. When we throw our trash away, uh, it miraculously disappears. But truth is we live in a closed sphere, so there is no way. It just goes somewhere that's out of sight, out of mind. So these are the systems that underpin modern civilization. And those systems, the technology behind these systems was developed mostly in the 19th and 20th century. So during a time that no one was thinking carbon life cycle and reconciling you know, greenhouse gas emissions, like it was just miraculous that we could you know, get power, get a light bulb to turn on or get a combustion engine to actually move us from A to B. Like that was amazing. No one was thinking about the planet seemed fi infinite, right? You know, you, like the atmosphere seemed infinite. Um, so, but now technologies exist that are, of course, just like everything else, cheaper, faster, better, cleaner, that, all, that can replace all this 19th and 20th century old cruddy polluting infrastructure with the new clean, better infrastructure. And what Full Cycle has done is identified all those technologies and all these different verticals and created this super interesting business model where we productize these massive infrastructure technologies just like a master franchisee does to i don't know like to starbucks and then puts capital behind them so you can just roll them out just like a franchise in your respective market in our market is the globe right you know because we don't you know, pollution, climate change doesn't know borders. It's not like, you know, it's not like we're just LA based or California based or US based. We have to be, we have to play on the global scale because what happens in Malaysia and Thailand affect what happens in California and New York. So we have to work at that level. And we also understand that you're always going to win if you bet on human self-interest. So what does that mean? That means that we pick technologies that fall into this Goldilocks nexus of not just, you know, modern productivity, efficiency, cleanliness, carbon neutrality, but also have a high IRR on the, on an, you know, on the investment basis such that whether somebody has an ideological agreement, disagreement on the climate side, they can invest through us and with us in projects because they're profitable, because it makes sense. And the nice thing about infrastructure is infrastructure is not a high risk type investment. It's a very traditionally boring investment. We make it more interesting by picking also technologies that have a double digit IRRs with an infrastructure risk profile, which is an asymmetrical risk return profile. So we've, we believe we've done everything we need to do now to create the platform to accelerate the deployment of climate restoring technologies around the world. And we're inviting everybody to join us so they can pour their capital for a good profit, for a good cause through full cycle. So we can quickly accelerate this deployment that we talked about, because again, and this is the last thing I'll say, um, is climate change is a race against time. You know, when was the first, when was the best opportunity to address this? 30 years ago. The second best time, obviously, is now. So since we don't have a time machine, it's basically now. And we got to do the best that we can as fast as we can. And now it really is a matter of just aggregating the capital and deploying it in all these technologies that we've already identified.
Yeah, that's great. It, it's interesting that it takes kind of climate change to hit you in the face for you to kind of first realize how big it is. I know, you know, right now I'm in Santa Monica, you're in Venice. And if we open up the windows, you'll smell this campfire type thing in the air right now. And it's from these fires that are happening 25 miles away. Uh, you know, some people will say, ah, it's normal. It's kind of like the cop out excuse to just kind of get away from it. Right. But yeah, there's a big well, issue. Go ahead. Well, so fires, you know, fires, floods, droughts, you know, these are normal events. What's not normal is the frequency and the accelerating uh, freak, like what used to be a thousand year storm now is a once in a decade storm. What used to be a 100 year flood is now almost an annual flood. You know, it, what used to be a once in a century drought now is the new normal. I mean, there's literally countries that will not see rainfall for decades at a time now, whose population will have to either rely on new technologies to desalinate ocean water, you know, in such at economics that they can afford, which we've identified a great tech for that, or they're going to have to move. So there's so many dominoes that fall because of these big, massive changes on the climate level that we can discount without understanding what we're talking about and say, oh, it's normal. Well, you know what's not normal is the pace and the condensed time frame of which these climate calamities are escalating. Do you see, when you look at an industry like the auto industry, Tesla was fantastic in paving the way. When they first came out, everyone was trying to squash them, make them not you know, stay alive. Now every big auto manufacturer is producing emission-free cars, and it's yeah. really happening at a rapid pace. I believe you're an early investor in Tesla, that's correct? That's correct, yep. So do you see that industry being a great example of just society adapting this lifestyle at a, at a quick pace? Do you think that from your perspective, from seeing all the companies that are coming through your cohort and coming through your investment opportunities, are they increasing the amount of people that are developing technologies with this in mind at a rapid pace, do you think? I believe so. I believe so. I, I think, you know, the, thankfully, there's such an awareness now that, you know, entrepreneurs are actually starting to think bigger and starting to think more wholesomely. You know, for a long time, so many of our brilliant minds were caught up trying to figure out what the, what the best algorithm to make us buy more stuff we don't need, right? It's like, you know, what do we, you know, do we, what do we, like, what are the priorities of what's needed right now? Is it a drone that delivers my pop brownies to my doorstep? Is it to make sure that my dog collar speaks to my toaster, you know, to my fridge and make sure that, oh, God forbid my milk's going to expire in 48 hours? Or is it to make sure that we can breathe clean air and our kids' developing lungs are not full of soot and our ocean, you know, and the flesh in fish is not chock full of microplastics, et cetera, and, you know, and 40% of the world needing to migrate because they can't grow food. I mean, let's, so I think there's an awareness about that now. So the brilliant minds are heading in that direction. Every big PE firm, private equity firm now has an impact fund or an impact mandate. You know, I find most of them very loose you know, because I think they're doing that because it's trendy, not because they genuinely care. You know, in our situation, we've been doing this for 20 years. We're not Johnny come lately to the space. You know, there's no way anybody can say, oh, you guys are just wolves, wolves in, cheap cloth uh, in uh, sheep's clothing trying to capitalize on a trend. If anything, we're actually sheep in wolves clothing, you know, because we care deeply about the environment. And we're environmentalists using the free market system to make massive change by producing economics that attract everybody into a solution. Right. And I mean, the type of funds that you talk to and the type of people you talk to is an exact representation of your philosophy and your investment criteria and all of that. One very scary statistic I saw is that the U.S. produces an average of 250 trillion pounds of garbage each day, which is more than 30% of the world's trash produced by 5% of the global population. That's crazy. What, like, it, for me, if I knew nothing about technology, is it as simple as taking all that trash, throwing it into a machine that can just 
turn it all null? Like, what's the deal? Like, how do we solve that issue? All right, so let's talk about trash for a second. First of all, I, you know, I hadn't heard that statistic. You know, there, like, there might be a zero plus or minus in there somewhere, but regardless, we are being buried in our trash. I mean, there's even a very cool website that shows, you know, how many, how, like, they have a photo of a guy and then the timer starts and it shows per second how quickly it takes to bury a human being in the amount of plastic, just plastic we produce. So here's the problem with, uh, with our trash. So our trash currently in 70% of the world gets thrown into an open dump. And you know, what happens with that dump is the trash breaks down into a gas called methane. Methane is a, a gas we don't talk about that often. We talk a lot about CO2, but methane is actually 100 times more heat trapping than CO2, it just doesn't linger as long. And so the methane molecule breaks down in about 100 years into CO2 and water vapor. But in the first 20 years, which is what we care about, it's 80 some percent heat trapping. And then it breaks down over time and it averages at about 23 times more heat trapping than CO2. Obviously, what we care about now is the molecule's first 20 years of heating capacity. So, um, so trash breaks down into methane or breaks down into a toxic sludge called leachate and, and goes into groundwater. And the reason why the oceans are full of plastic is because these big open pits, once it rains, it carries the garbage into a ravine, into a river, into our oceans. No, that's the problem. In the rest of the world that has a more sanitary solution to garbage, think about how unproductive it is to produce plastic and packaging and food waste and garden waste and industrial waste and commercial waste and then put it in a truck that runs on diesel driving hundreds of miles to a landfill which is basically a hole in the ground it just happens to be lined so it doesn't you know ruin our groundwater and then dump it in there and then when it's full just cover it and call it a day and go dig another hole in the ground well guys this is a resource our garbage is a resource like right now there's a company in the Netherlands called Sonova. So Sonova developed a technology that can break down any hydrocarbons, which is all garbage is except for the glass and the metal, which can be recycled. Everything else can break down into its component gases. They call it a rich gas or a super gas. And it contains the molecules for energy production, for plastic production, for biofuel production, so imagine taking all of our garbage and producing the building blocks of plastic. So now we have a closed loop system. We don't have to go dig another hole in the ground to suck up fossil fuels to make plastic. We can make plastic from our plastic. The first time we have a real solution to, which is genuinely called recycling, because A, we've never actually had recycling. We've only had downcycling. And now with China and Asia no longer taking you know, first you know, developing nation garbage, it, the recycling that we used to do, which was 9%, is now down to 4.3% anyway. So that's crazy. Yeah, I was speaking with this. Uh, so we had a, a woman on our podcast, Kate Nelson. She calls herself the plastic free mermaid. And she lives a plastic free lifestyle to the extreme mm -hmm. and to the extent. And she talked about that, how the first time we shipped our, our garbage to China, and then they said, no, we can't have it anymore. Then we shipped it to uh, Malaysia. They shipped it back. We don't have it anymore. Um, so for the first time, what you're saying is with this technology that exists, we can essentially, instead of creating more plastic, we can take this huge reservoir of plastic we've already used and then just keep using it. So basically not getting rid of it, but just reusing it and putting a What's clip on everything we've done. What's the problem? If, there, if it's not accumulating, it's not choking up our rivers and our oceans and our landfills. I mean, plastic is great. Obviously, we don't want microplastic. Those things are a nightmare. I mean, we literally breathe them and we eat them without even seeing them every day. So we want to be careful how we expose ourselves to plastic. But I don't know about you. Have you used the, uh, uh, a, um, um, uh, those new paper straws, the cardboard straws? Yeah, people get so upset about them. <laughs> They're awful. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I mean, like, but if we know that, you know, we can use the straw, if we choose to use the straw, I barely use straws, but if we choose to use a plastic straw, knowing that 
it is actually turning into another plastic straw, turning into another plastic straw to infinity was the problem. It's like, you know, the, not, that I'm, not that I believe technology is a panacea to everything. I just, um, you know, I think we need to be responsible with our behavior, definitely reuse, use less, buy less stuff. We've been programmed to be such consumers, but at the same time, we can, you know, live a low friction lifestyle if we upgrade our systems to be aligned with our modern life. Be responsible and have systems that take into account how we live and how the planet needs to reconcile its capabilities. So what's the barrier to entry to be able to, if I'm a, if I'm a small business and I just created the next iPhone and now I need to package it in plastic and I'm going to go shop the international markets to go find a uh, component of where I can use my plastic and I'm looking at options A, B, and C. A and B are super cheap, the same thing we've been using forever. Then there's C, which is this recycled plastic, which is the same stuff, but it says five times more. Is that the issue right now? It's just the cost is, is too high for this stuff? No, I don't think, I think, I think, you know, like, remember, uh, you know, production, you know, uh, is, 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 is a very, it's a system, right? And trying to turn a, a, such a massive system is slow. You know, the, so the guy who produces the non-recycled stuff already has all of these economies of scale available. Like they're just, you know, it's, it requires more demand because more demand will make the responsible producer have more economies of scale, more uh, shipping uh, capability, cheaper um, systems of delivery, et cetera, just like the old guy did because he had decades to build it. The new guy hasn't had decades, so they haven't yet fine-tuned all these things and dropped the price. So I believe the people who can afford it should always pay the premium in the beginning. That's what Tesla did, right? Like they sold us a ninety and a hundred thousand dollar sedan and a hundred ninety and hundred thousand dollar SUV, and that paved the way for the fifty thousand dollar everybody car that's going to be dropping to thirty five thousand. And now more and more people have access to an electric car, but it was our responsibility to buy that $100,000 vehicle so the $35,000 one can be available to everyone. That makes a lot of sense. That makes a, yeah. So if someone has to go in there and, and bite the bullet and, and take that first jump and that's what's going to cause that ripple effect. So, I mean, Brahim, your whole life, you're doing the VC thing. I mean, it's kind of this picture perfect epic lifestyle, right? Like you're, you're helping the world, you're doing what you love, but it's also a for-profit type of business where, you know, you're, you're making investment deals that are making people money. And that's also helping the environment. How did you get into this life? Like, where were you post-college? Like, what was like those years after college look like for you? So I, I was very lucky. I was dating uh, in college, a young lady who was a lot more aware about uh, the environment, about toxicity, and about nutrition than I was. You know, I was like a, you know, a music lover. A, like, you know, this was where my head was. So what she, what she educated me about, she educated me on monocultures, on depleted farmlands, on how the apples that we eat today or any vegetable or fruit that we eat today doesn't have the nutritional density out of an apple that our grandparents or great grandparents used to eat because the soil is depleted. So it doesn't even have those nutrition to suck out of the ground to put into the apple. You know, most what we do now, we just spray chemical fertilizer and that gives the, the fruit and vegetable the, the minimum it needs to form, but there isn't the mineral, the minerals in the soil that used to be, there used to be. So we'd have, she'd, she'd have both of us supplement our diet every day with these organic food-based vitamins. And they were a little too big to swallow, I remember. And I thought to myself every day, one day I would like to take, if I ever started a business, I wanna make vitamins that are easier to swallow. And when the opportunity presented itself to start that business, that was the first business I started in college. And it was, you know, just one of those things where it was the right product at the right time. America was waking up to 
the need for supplementation and that industry took off and I was one of the lucky people who just happened to have a positive brand, a quality product at the right time. Yeah, well, you just dropped the word lucky like it's, you know, you didn't put yourself in that position to get lucky. What was that whole process like being a young entrepreneur? I mean, you created a product. What was, did you have like up crazy ups and downs throughout just getting that product out? Like what was some of those early challenges? So, um, you know, thankfully I was young, wet behind the ears and naive, right? Which is in, it, in its own way, luck. Like, because it's, you know, if I was one of those people who thought things through too much, you know, I might have found a thousand reasons, A, why not to start, or B, why what's facing me is this insurmountable problem. I just was too naive and gullible to even think that way and just did the things, right? Like make the stuff, sell the stuff, make more of the stuff, sell more of the stuff, keep rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. And, you know, I mean, I was sincere about what I was offering. It wasn't just like, oh, gee, this is a great market. I should capitalize on it. You know, no, I, this is something that I believed in and wanted to have in the world. So when I was representing it, it was coming from a place of contribution, not from a place of marketing. Like it was, it was marketing, but it was sincere. Awesome. Yeah. I, we had a, my friend Dan Hunt was on this. He's had a really successful company at 19 years old. And he's at the time he raised $42 million at 19 years old. And looking back at it, he says that he was delusionally confident, mm -hmm. you know, like you That's couldn't, I was delusionally confident. You're right. I think it's a really good, it's a great way of just painting that picture of like, you couldn't tell me otherwise, but looking back, it's like, Ooh, like <laughs> I, would, I should have second guessed, like what, you know, putting that out there. So you made a killing with that company. And then did you take those proceeds and just go right into VC or did you, what, what was the no, next there was, there was another company before that, that also did well. Then it was about the time that the internet came onto the scene and I did not do, I mean, I had a great company that was revenue positive and was growing. But then the dot-com crash happened and we couldn't raise another round. And so we didn't, you know, we cratered that company because we couldn't fund it uh, moving forward. And that's when I took a little bit of time off, you know, was enjoying the proceeds and the, you know, from the fruits of my decades of entrepreneurial labor. And then that uh, scuba diving story happened. I took a year off, studied the climate math, the carbon math, the, you know, what's, what, what are the real issues? And then started directing my capital strictly towards that. Of course, there was a lot of general technology investing in the meantime, because, you know, once you have the resources, you know, you start seeing deals and some make sense and some don't. And, you know, I was also lucky in investments as well. And I'm fortunate for that. You know, I mean, it's it, being in California also gives us a chance to look at certain deal flow that is, unique in the world and we're also <laughs> we're like this podcast is going to be called lucky we're also lucky to happen to be living here in because it provides so much opportunity how how has things changed in your perspective coming from being in the trenches being an entrepreneur and building companies to be the one now investing in these companies and giving these entrepreneurs insights of things that you have learned like what's what's what have you learned in that process that it takes different skill sets to take companies through different stages. And it's very difficult to help entrepreneurs understand that and allow the company to transition from their own uh, limitations as, what's the word? The, uh, what's, the, what's that phrase your friend used? Delusionally confident. Yeah, because their delusional confidence will only take you so long because skills, at some point, you need a, another set of skill sets. So you can do what Steve Jobs did, which is hire great people that are better than you and get out of their way, you know. Right. Or, you know, or you start stifling the company. So there's a lot of lessons. I mean, we can, that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. But it's a, it is fortunate to be able to contribute to these entrepreneurs based on firsthand experiential entrepreneurial and investment successes and failures such that, you know, if they're willing to listen and they're, you know, and they're willing to learn, I can be 
a good, a good investor, a more additive investor, maybe a more uh, contributive board member when I'm inclined to do so. And I think that's helped some of the companies I've invested in. Yeah, really cool. So when we talk about passion and we just talk about excitement for life mm -hmm. of everything you do in your day to day, what brings you the most just passion? We call it stoke. You know, what gets you so excited and fired up and you're just like, wow, I feel alive. That's so interesting that you asked that because uh, what, you know, the, I have, like, I have passion for children because they get to, because here's how I see it. You know, our parents, our generation have, in, this is the best time to be alive, right? Like it's, there's the least wars, the least famine, the least disease. And we're, you know, yes, the climate is going to get disrupted in our lifetime, but in our kids' lifetime and our grandkids' lifetime, it's no longer about stabilization or destabilization. It's about inhabitability. So they are completely innocent, right? Like they didn't do this. They didn't, you know, overspend, you know, got drunk on consumerism, traveled the world. Like they're just young kids who are just about to face their whole future. So when I think about handing them a world that works, that inspires me to no end. To such a degree that when I have investors who invest in full cycle, Sometimes I ask them if they're willing to put the investment in their young kids' names because I would like to one day when, they, when the kids receive the benefits from the investment, I can tell them the whole story and I get to wake up knowing that I'm working on behalf of these children instead of, let's say, their parents who are already va you know, vastly wealthy and just want to do good, which I'm so grateful for their partnership for. But that extra layer of motivation and stokeness comes from knowing that I'm working on behalf of the kids. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, it's cool perspective because most people just put kids down, modern day kids, because they're just like, they're just buried in their phones and their iPads. And I mean, it's hard not to be. It's definitely an addiction. Well, I mean, if you're, think about it, think about this. If you're, um, if you're born into a world where, you know, you know, racism, sexism, climate destruction are so in your face all the time. You're just a kid, man. You just want to play. Like, why is it in your face? Why are you like, you know, why are you facing an existential future that you had nothing to do with? Of course, you want to distract yourself. Of course, you want to isolate yourself with your peers because who's going to understand? Like, your parents are not going to be around to, you know, to realize the, uh, the destruction that past generations have given them, and they're aware of it. So, like, of, like, we all need a break, and this is their break, a little bit of zoning out from reality. Yeah, we all need to get there, and it's these conversations that help pave the path. You know, people just that are making the moves to, to instead of just changing how they act every single day to have a ripple effect. I talked about Kate Nelson, the plastic free mermaid, because I think that what she's doing is so cool because she lives it and breathes it. Like I can tell you to live plastic free and you can get like a, a rush out of that. And I can post on social media or I can see you, you know, rolling up to the smoothie shop with a glass jar and making them put it in the glass jar. That's going to be a lot more impactful for me to see you do than just to, to tell and, and to watch, which is, I dream that there's going to be a hundred times more full cycles in the world in five to 10 years because we need them. How many other firms are like you out there? Are you a, a golden egg right now? Or? So our business model, the, the, you know, there's no other business model like ours. You remember the, the part where we invest in the companies that are ready for prime time? That's another misconception is is the climate has no time for venture capital right now. Like something that's still in the pilot stage, demonstration stage, or even in the lab, just because it's, just because it's a, in like aspirational and exciting doesn't mean it's going to help us because it's going to take that lab-based technology, if it ever makes it to commercialization, about a decade at least. And when you're talking about infrastructure technologies, 
might even be two decades for commercialization. The climate doesn't have that. So our model is to identify market-ready technologies that, again, fall into that Goldilocks nexus of readiness, high return, and a massive carbon abatement capability, and that the founders are willing to create a partnership with us such that we productize their offering in, let's say, a small, medium, and large size, so we're not spending time custom delivering solutions to anybody. It's like, hey, here are the three options. They ship to you in X amount of containers. We fund it, you know, and go. So this, you know, so things happen quickly because, you know, it's going to take a lot to change all the underpinnings of modern civilization. We're talking about trillions of dollars a year, but hey, if it's profitable, why not invest in it? What better, inve what better return can we have? Clean environment, great balance sheets, clean, you know, a healthy future and a healthy uh, profit and loss statement. Like everybody wins. We just, and ironically, we've designed it so well. Our biggest problem is people going, what's the catch? <laughs> How do you respond to that? You can never win, right? People <laughs> were so conditioned to be skeptical. Well, I mean, you're always taking some sort of risk in anything you do. And the catch is that, you know, we don't execute well. So fortunately, you know, this is not our first or second or third rodeo. We assembled the team of extraordinary um, uh, execution, uh, experienced professionals. And we're minimizing that, but there's always going to be an execution risk or, you know, some, we always don't know what we don't know. So nothing is a hundred percent guaranteed, but neither is any other investment. So. Absolutely. Well played. Yeah. I, I, since I have my iPhone connected to my computer, I get text message notifications and my friend just texted me saying there's legitimately ash falling in Santa Monica right now. Wow. Damn dude. Crazy. Here's a, here's something I'm curious about with, you get to see this first like window open of all these technologies before anybody, any consumer gets to see it before it's in the news and all that. You know, what are some of these technologies that just blow your brain that are like, you're just like, wow, someone created this. Yeah. So I, I alluded to it a little bit earlier. Um, so check this out. Um, so climate uh, modeling shows that around the equator, you know, the subtropics, which are, you know, traditionally lush and green, uh, are going to all turn into deserts because the, the temperature is going to be too high. It's going to basically scorch the earth around that. And the water cycle is always going to be the same. The same amount of water is going to evaporate. The same percentage is going to fall down. It's just that some places it's going to become permanent droughts and some places going to become frequent floods. So in the subtropics, it turns into desert. So that means that 40% of the world's population either has to have a technological answer to how to make water at a price that makes sense, or they have to move somewhere where there's going to be water. So there's a technology that was originally developed uh, at MIT, but now being commercialized through a company in Massachusetts. And what these guys have done is they've created desalination, which is the, the ability to take ocean water and put it through what's called the membrane that captures the salt and lets the water through. But because they've designed this in a new way, the plant itself is much cheaper than, uh, than a traditional desalination plant. And most importantly, it doesn't use fossil fuels or nuclear power to power this energy intensive process. It uses wave technology. So the actual waves in the ocean where the plant is uh, built anyway, the movement of the waves is what powers the desalination, which lowers the operating cost by about nine times. Wow. So now, you know, the world has a much cheaper desal technology to allow people to stay where they are, continue to grow food, continue to have clean water, and not have to migrate en migrate masse. Because as we know, societies don't do well if there's too much change too quickly. I mean, the in, e European Union almost collapsed because of three million Syrian and Iraq and ref Iraqi refugees Imagine what's going to happen if that number is a hundred times that. 
So you run into that. That's so cool. First of all, you can utilize waves to generate electricity to then power a desalination tank that can basically take seawater and make it drinkable. Boom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So fantastic. I, I guess I, I, at that point, you're just worried about hurricanes or something coming and just breaking those devices. Yeah. I mean, some devices, I mean, I mean, <laughs> we can't, I mean, the, like, the good news is, is once, you know, the, when the weather forecast is gloomy that way, you know, the, the, those flaps get tied to the bottom, like they have contingencies, but of course stuff will happen. And that's what insurance is for. Speaking mm -hmm. of insurance, do you know what the insurance industry now uh, labels as the number one threat to the industry ahead of terrorism, ahead of cyber hacking, ahead of financial uh, disruption? I would, I mean, I'm just thinking like fires. Climate change. So for anybody who's de debating whether climate change is uh, real or not, just remind them the $5 trillion a year industry whose entire survival is based on very accurate modeling and predictions puts climate change as the number one factor threatening their industry. And so they might know a little more than this climate denier who just read a headline in some random uh, online forum and is just regurgitating it because it somehow fits into some, you know, cultural model that they've subscribed to. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great sign right there. I mean, that's, everybody has insurance. If the insurance companies are recognizing this is real, you're, they, they're trying to cover their asses because they know that it's a big issue and they're trying to stay afloat. So like, what's more competent than that? Yeah. So what about, I read back in 2013 that you actually produced a documentary. I did. So have you always been a filmmaker at heart? No, no. This is just like, it's a, it was a documentary uh, that uh, caught my attention because it was about the Egyptian revolution. It was the first time that, you know, a revolution for democracy, for freedom was captured firsthand. Like the footage was being captured as it was happening. So I wanted to support bringing that forth to the world so we know what it looks like instead of just reading uh, about it in history books later. And it was like, it was so, it was a great ride. It was a responsible thing to get behind. And we got nominated for an Oscar and we, get to, we got to go to the Academy Awards. And I was actually telling a story the other day when, when I hit the red carpet, you know, like all of these people in the rafters were like, ah! And my ego was like, wow, they know me. And then, I looked, and then I looked to the right and right next to me was Meryl Streep. And I was like, oh yeah, that makes more sense. <laughs> so, and then also on top of that, you won this very amazing award, the Global Green Millennium Award. So what is that? What is that award? So this is a 30 year organization that's very well respected. It's Los Angeles based and has done so much good around the world. And uh, they gave a bunch of awards that year. It was four different ones. And, you know, the, I was really touched to be amongst the, uh, the people who got honored that day. And, you know, I've, um, you know, I mean, you know, do you know, um, I forget his name. Gosh, too bad. If I knew you were going to ask me that, I would have looked up some of the other awardees. They were so, I mean, very badass people badass people and I was just I was humbled to be included amongst them and uh, yeah and I mean we're just we're getting a lot of attention let's just say that I mean we're you know I just spoke at the United Nations it's not the first time I've done it I'm you know getting invited to speak both about the model and about climate change and you know I'm not like this is not some big ego trip for me I have no interest in getting on yet another plane and packing and unpacking and then my wife is so tired of like the sacrifice that we have to make as a family, or we, sorry, we choose to make as a family, but, you know, having platforms where we get to say what's going on and add our voice to this conversation is the responsibility of our time. So we have to say yes, and we have to do what is needed until addressing the climate crisis becomes part of everyone's rent for being a citizen on the planet. Like there is no free rides anymore. This is a, you know, arm in arm, no, you know, like, you know, what's ahead of nationalism is like a planet that works. Cause no, you know, it's like, so it's, this is beyond party 
This is beyond race. This is beyond gender. This is beyond nation. This is the first global threat that affects all of us. And hopefully, whether, you know, we come together and we get better as a civilization on how we treat each other because we're now facing a common threat. And hopefully that brings us together and elevates us beyond these old inherited frictions that we still unfortunately suffer from, but we seem to be getting better at addressing. What you just mentioned is what I was trying to get at in the beginning of this podcast, where we were just talking about the vibe at that Planet Home event. I felt mm-hmm. like that was the vibe, you know, just like almost just like Burning Man meets let's make shit happen. It was just very cool. Everyone was all about helping each other flow and, and all this. And this is, a, this is a kind of a flagship question. Uh, we like to ask anybody that's you know, making moves in their life, following their dreams and, and just living an interesting life. And it talks about, you know, what would you say if you could go back in time and you know, whisper something before you even went to college, you know, 17, 18 year old you, uh, that would have saved you say a ton of time, money, heartbreak, headache, et cetera, that, and it can't be, I wouldn't have said anything because it's made me who I am. Yeah. So for me, um, I would have, you know, I would have held my young self by the collar, you know, and like, like brought myself right up nose to nose and looked right into my younger self's eyes and said, the most important thing, the most important thing you have to remember in every circumstance is to be kind. Like be kind, be kind. Like kindness is so underrated and you know, like if I was to address anything other than the climate crisis, it would be the kindness crisis. Because it's not that, you know, like we could be so much healthier as a society if we were just to set our petty grievances and our self absorbed uh, um, disposition and and just be kind to each other. Doesn't mean you have to tear yourself apart and give yourself you know, to everybody, just in every interaction, in every relationship, whether it works or doesn't work or benefits or doesn't benefit or even is an adverse re- relationship, it's okay. Like, be kind. It is, it'll, I look back at my life and if I could change anything it would be all the times where i had the opportunity to be kind and i didn't show up with kindness those are my only regrets that's the only one wow that's not even regrets it's mostly just what if you had a fast pass right like you you've ever been to an amusement park everyone loves the fast pass sure you know, what is is there anything else that you can think about that's like that would just have made you learn something way quicker without having to just go through the rigors of trial and error Gosh, you know, I, I would have asked for mentorship, right? Because I, everything I did, I, I, I kind of grew up in a vacuum. Like, I mean, it's everything I did. I was, I started it myself. I, you know, I was always kind of the, you know, I'm a first generation American. So I didn't have like, you know, my father's buddies who were self-made or, you know, I never played team sports. It was scuba diving and karate, which are individual sports. It's just how my life went. You know, I mean, I grew up in the Middle East. So back then it was soccer. And even then I was this chubby kid that they were like, hey, fat, so go plug the hole. And I was the goalie. So the like, so even that is an individual position. So it was just, I was never um, in, a, in, a, in a place where I was able to ask for mentorship and it never crossed my mind. So I would have loved that piece. So if this is to any entrepreneur who's listening, don't be shy in finding people who have are farther down the road than you are and talk to them, you know, ask them humbly, vulnerably for their mentorship. And some will say yes, and you will leap frog so many situations that you have to learn through trial and error, which costs you time, costs you frustration, maybe in some cases will cost you your business. And all of that would have not been the case if you just had somebody who's been further down the road than you willing to share with you 
whether to turn right or left at the, at the fork that you're about to reach. That is such a big key. That is fantastic. I mean, if we throw more Hail Marys out there, you never know who is going to be at the other side of that. Mm -hmm. And with the internet today, you can send a Hail Mary in any way, shape, or form. You can message anybody. We live in a world where people are always looking at the phone and you have direct access into what they're looking at. I mean, if you're so persistent, you can't fail in getting in contact with the people you want to get in contact. So that's such a fantastic message right there. Thank you for sharing with that. And this is the last staple, you know, the last Len Jones party of two staple. And it has to do with, what would you say that person that's right on the fence of jumping into entrepreneurship for the first time? Communicate to everybody in your life and enroll them in what you're about to go through. Meaning I'm going to go down the your, your husband, your wife, your family, your friends, uh, everybody, and just say, listen, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna go down this road, so I'm gonna need your support, I may be absent a lot, I need your support and understanding. Um, if you know people who are interested at all involved uh, in any area that resembles what I'm doing, please introduce me to them and just stay humble, stay vulnerable, stay communicative, and like work like the, you know, like your life depends on it because it's going to take for the first years, no matter what, I've never seen an enterprise that didn't require pushing that heavy boulder up that steep mountain until you get to the top. And then of course it gets a lot easier, but for the first years, it's going to take a lot and that's okay. As long as everybody around you it see, you know, has been communicated with and, agree, and agrees to be part of your support system, that'll make it so much easier. Enroll them in your plan. I like yeah. that. Now you're yeah. setting, you got to set expectations because it's going to, mm-hmm. if you don't have that support circle, you have enough stress as it is running a business, let alone, you know, miscommunication that can be solvable just by being upfront. So thank you so much for sharing with that. Raheem, I could talk to you about so many subjects and I, I really hope I get the chance in the future. So uh, don't be surprised if you get another call about copping back on the podcast and then coming in, we'll do some in-person stuff. We're actually uh, looking, we're, we're, we're getting a new house soon. We're going to have like a whole podcast studio and really taking things right. to the next level, right? Uh, which, which is going to be awesome. So man, I appreciate you so much. Thank you for, for doing what you do, putting your dollars and things that help. And let's try to get, let's try to get rid of some of this ash hanging out from Santa Monica right now. Yeah. Blessings and, uh, you know, prayers to all the people whose homes are being burnt right now and all the evacuees and we, you know, thanks to all the fire people, firemen and women who are, you know, putting their lives on the line to help. And, you know, if there's, I don't know if you find anywhere where we can contribute the, I, I've been begging my wife to let me be a, to let me train to be um, a, a volunteer fireman and she refuses to let me. So I'm going to keep working on it. We'll see if one day she'll, uh, she'll be okay with that possibility. I mean, it's anyway, prayers to all the people who are not just being rained on with ash, but who's actually, who are actually losing their homes and their lives. Amen. Brahim, we appreciate you. Thank you for listening to another episode of Len Jones Party of Two. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a review and subscribe to stay up to date on our new episodes. And remember, hope is not a strategy. Keep making moves. Till next time, peace.